Uh, okay. So, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so, since this is my last lecture, I thought I'd just take a second and thank, again, the department for the honor of this invitation. I really appreciate it. And I've really had a good time and learned a lot. And I really appreciate the wonderful hospitality. So, thank you. And now let's move on to philosophy. Uh, so, uh, in this lecture, I'm going to try to bring together the discussion last time, which was tied to earlier discussions about self-governance. Only last time I talked about a planning agent's self-governance over time. Now I'm going to bring that together with our issues about rationality uh, in a fairly explicit way. Uh, so, just so you uh, have a kind of map, I'm going to uh, pull together the pieces uh, of the kind of construction of a planning agent's self-governance. The pieces are there from last time. I'm just going to pull them together. Uh, then I'm going to discuss how it seems to me that helps us think about plan diachronic plan rationality. Then I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this issue that's been floating around about why diachronicalized standpoints are needed, where the idea of a diachronicalized standpoint is a standpoint that includes the end of diachronic self-governance. I'm going to then return to this issue that I put on hold, which is the, what I've been calling the reason desideratum, the idea that, uh, the, or the condition, that to be a, a, a norm of rationality, we need to, in, to justify that claim. We need to explain why systematically there's present a reason for conformity. And I'm going to consider that question with respect to both the synchronic and diachronic norms that we've been discussing. There'll be a brief interlude, uh, the subject of which I'll let you uh, wonder about. And then uh, I'm going to try to wrap up by reflecting on the, the actual theme or issue of the lectures, which is the reflective stability of our rational plan dynamics. OK, so um, this is a kind of shorthand version of the model, if you will, of a planning agent's diaconic self-governance. It involves planned temporally extended activity. It involves self-governance at times along the way. So, for example, Ulysses doesn't satisfy that condition. Uh, it involves these plan-infused cross-temporal interconnections uh, that are kind of built into temporally extended planning agency. But part of the rationale for claiming that is that these, as I argued last time, these cross-temporal uh, interconnections, planned structured in interconnections, uh, have, have kind of deep analogies. Uh, with the structure of interlocking intentions of individuals and shared agency. So in diachronic self-governance, there is a metaphor that's, it's just a metaphor, but in a sense, we're doing it together. We meaning myself over time. Um, and then the argument from last time about willpower was that a kind of basic element of a planning agent's diachronic self-governance is going to involve diachronicalized standpoints. Uh, because and they're going to help support the coordination between the kind of, as it were, the two kinds of coherence involved in diachronic self-governance. So you can think of diachronic self-governance of a plan, of a planning agent, as involving both coherence at a time. This is involved in the broadly Frankfortian picture of this self-governance at a time, and in a kind of coherence in the sense of this kind of cross-temporal organization, plan theoretic cross-temporal organization over time. And the diachronicalized standpoints, which include this end of diachronic self-governance, help support the coordination of those two. That's why we end up being able to say, uh, according to the theory, that um, it's possible for willpower, sticking to your resolve in the face of temptation, uh, to, um, to satisfy the conditions of both synchronic and diachronic self-governance, even though initially it looks puzzling. OK. Um, these are the kind of examples that have been driving my discussion, and I won't uh, go through this again, but you have it in your handout. You can go home and see what I would say about each, <laughs> uh, about diachronic self-governance in those cases. Uh, and now I want to move on. Uh, so if you remember, the kind of one of the kind of overarching ideas is we try to get a rationale for these rationality norms. That's Harmon's term, the rationale, by seeing them as, to some extent, tracking it forms of coherence that are partly constitutive of important kinds of self-governance. Now, 
I'm going to extend that idea shortly, but that's the basic idea, and that's what we did with the synchronic norms in the first, uh, sorry, in the second lecture, though we didn't, y y we still have this, over this kind of background worry that we haven't explained why there's any reason to conform to these norms. We, what we have is the idea that what the norms are tracking is the coherence involved in self-governance. In the synchronic case, synchronic self-governance, I'm going to now talk about diachronic self-governance. Um, but we still have to say, what's the big deal about all that? Okay, okay, okay. So the way I want to think about diachronic self-governance, where I'm talking about di sorry, scratch that. The way I want to think about diachronic plan rationality is, remember, to, uh, so I'm going back and forth between speaking in my own voice and speaking on the half of a planning agent who's reflecting. Okay, so, so if I'm a planning agent who's reflecting about the patterns of thought that are characteristic of my planning agent, I want to make sense of them. Um, uh, I've already, if I've gotten to the fourth lecture, <laughs> uh, noticed that I can make some sense uh, of my synchronic norms by seeing them as tracking coherence involved in synchronic self-governance of a sort that's characteristic of a planning agent. And now I'm going to generalize. So, as the way, so I'm going to s say, well, uh, it worked for the synchronic norms. <laughs> now, maybe the right way to think about the any kind of diachronic norm of planned rationality is it's tracking uh, forms of coherence that are partly constitutive of diachronic self-governance. Okay, okay. Uh, so that would, this, is, this idea is also kind of fits nicely with the, what I had called the commonality desideratum, the idea that we're looking for a way of understanding the kind of deep structure, the underlying rationale for these norms that picks out what, what commonality there is. And the commonality here is self-governance, except self-governance involves self-governance at a time and self-governance over time. And in the case of the diachronic rationality norms, uh, the, the conjecture is what it's tracking is the coherence involved in self-governance over time, okay, where that coherence is kind of has is has kind of two dimensions, right? It involves coherence at times and coherence across times, and it involves the coordination of those two, which was one of the functions of the diachronicalization of the standpoints that I talked about. Okay, so uh, let's see. I think I can just move on. So, so the idea is, what w uh, a reflective planning agent will naturally be led and reasonably led to the thought that. Um, uh, um, uh, that the, the that there's a kind of rational pressure that that's being captured by these norms uh, in f in the in favor of uh, the, of the forms of coherence characteristic of planning agent self governance synchronic and diachronic and that gives us what I think I've called before a kind of initial prima facie self governance based case in favor of a principle I'm about to say but let me emphasize first the, the why I put the phrase initial <laughs> prima facie <laughs> for all these qualifications, right? Um, the remember, uh, uh, the idea is now we can kind of see how you can think of these norms as tracking conditions of self-governance, but we still have to worry about the reason desideratum. Why do I have a reason to conform to norms that track conditions of self-governance? So, uh, so we're still bracketing that, and that's why the case is still an initial prima facie case, but the case what does it support? Well, given our model of a planning agent's diachronic self-governance, you can the, the it seems to me a, a, a principle of plan rationality that gets supported is one that says, look, if you're engaged in a plan temporally extended activity at that's so far been self-governing, both synchronically and diachronically. Um, and I'm going to skip to C now and be a little more intuitive that way. And right now, your standpoint would support continuing with that activity, then if you don't continue with activity, in which case you're making a choice that blocks your continued self-governance because you're breaking the intention connections, then that's a breakdown, a rational breakdown. Okay, so the, the idea is a planning agent's diachronic self-governance involves uh, activity that so far 
been self-governing at, at times along the way and satisfied any conditions of diachronic self-governance up to now. And now the question is, is it going to continue with that activity? Well, if your standpoint fa supports continuing and you don't, that's the breakdown. That is the principle or norm of diachronic plan rationality that seems to emerge from the effort to, to, to understand diachronic plan rationality as, as tracking the, the kind of dual coherence conditions, both synchronic and diachronic, and the coordination of the dual coherence condition that's built into diachronic self-governance. If you take that norm and apply it to brute shuffling case, you get a fairly straightforward answer. Namely, in brute shuffling, it's a breakdown in diachronic, sorry, it's a breakdown. It's, there's, is, there's putting aside worries about the feasibility, uh, there's, a, there's a pro tanto irrationality in brute shuffling. Why? Because here's, here's uh, um, Sartre's young man who's been helping his mom, good boy that he is, uh, though he realized there's an incomparability or non-comparability between mom and the free French. And he changes his mind on the spot because after all, the non-comparability remains. His standpoint at the time of changing his mind actually supports helping his mom and also supports fighting with the free French. That's the point of the, the, these, these considerations being non-comparable. But in flipping, in brutally shuffling, to use the terminology of my earlier lectures, what he does is he makes a choice that blocks his continued diachronic self-governance because he blocks the continuity, the plan theoretic continuity. Right. So, so th though he acts in a way that's in, that's in sync with his present standpoint, because his present standpoint supports mom and it also supports free French, he violates this historical, this condition that has an essentially historical element to it, namely where is he coming from? Right, okay. So the brute shuffling case is just a kind of natural case to apply this principle to. What about willpower in the face of anticipated temptation? Well, this is harder because if we, whoops, if we, uh, so uh, <laughs> this has nothing to do with what's going to happen tonight after this lecture. <laughs> but if you were to resolve not to have more than one glass of beer <laughs> this evening, uh, and um, now the time has come, and you're in this Richard Holton way, your 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 value of judgments shifts, and you now think, as you anticipated, you would think it would be great to have the, ex the extra alcohol, though you know that later you'll think that was a bad idea, and that earlier you thought it was a bad idea, and you have this resolution not to. So that so the question is, um, what to say? What does DPR say about the rationality of sticking with your resolution in that case? We know what it says about the rationality of resisting brute shuffling, but the rationality of sticking to resolution, we don't really know what it says because we really don't know. So you, here you are, so far, let's suppose, up to the party, everything, you've engaged in this activity of kind of working through your day that involves having this party, okay? Uh, um, but we don't know whether your present standpoint uh, uh, su supports a choice to continue with that activity, which would be to stick to the resolution. The activity is being guided by the resolution, okay, the prior intention. Why not? Well, on the one hand, it looks like it doesn't, because the whole description of the temptation case that we're getting from Holton is that there's a shift in judgment, and it, so it looks like you think it would be better not to continue with that activity. But if the standpoint were s diachronicalized, we don't know if it is yet, but if it were diachronicalized, that means to say if, you're if the standpoint of the tempted agent would include the end of diachronic self-governance, you can see how that would support sticking to the resolution under certain circumstances. Maybe not all circumstances, because it may be diachronic self-governance isn't nearly as important to the agent as the alcohol. <laughs> uh, and I don't speak autobiographically, but you know, you know. Um, but um, basically we have the possibility of a, 
of, of a shift back in favor of the resolution where that shift is grounded in the end of diachronic self-governance. It's not a kind of kind of arbitrary claim that the resolution has priority, which I talked about briefly last time. Right, okay. But we don't know. Th I mean, there are, two, there are two things we don't know. One is, one we're not going to know at the end of today, which is, um, well, sometimes the end of diachronic self-governance is sufficiently significant to the agent that it will support a shift back in favor of the sticking to the resolution, and sometimes it isn't. I'm leaving that as kind of unsettled, okay? You know, it's going to continue to be unsettled. But the other thing we don't know is whether the end itself is there, because so far from what we said, it just could be, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, right? Okay, so to apply DPR to the willpower cases, we need to reflect on whether or not these standpoints are going to be diachronicalized. Okay, so that's my question. And my strategy here, now, remember, in the background is the strategy of some philosophers to think that the end, so in this case of diachronic self-governance, or maybe just the end of self-governance, is kind of built into agency. It's a constitutive aim of agency or something like that. I've explained why I don't think that's a good strategy. So I need some other way of thinking about why, if it's true, it isn't just kind of completely optional whether that end is in the standpoint. It's not a constitutive aim of agency, so what's, what's special about that end or aim of diachronic self-governance where that means, whoops, yeah. Wait a second, what did I just happen? Oh yeah, where that end or aim of diachronic self-governance is what is needed to make room for the possibility of a reshift of standpoint in favor of willpower in the, in the willpower case, okay. And the strategy I'm going to follow in pursuing that question, uh, rather than some say, say the end of diachronic self-governance is somehow constitutive agency or something, the strategy is going to be uh, yet a further generalization of the appeal to conditions of self-governance that we've already seen at work. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about uh, how we've been thinking, we, you, me, and the reflective planning agent, the original idea back in the second lecture <laughs> I know it seems like history now, but anyway, uh, the original idea was, again, all this is kind of initial argumentation with the reason desideratum on the side, but the, the idea was the reflective planning agent is going to be led in particular to PCC. PCC is the norm of plan consistency and coherence, right? By way of the thought that the best norm of explanation of our plan-infused practical thinking uh, draws on the significance of the coherence involved in our synchronic self-governance because the idea is PCC, the norm that enjoins plan consistency and coherence, is basically tracking a kind of coherence that's part of synchronic self-governance. Okay. Okay. Then what we did, this is still all, on, we're on recall still, okay. Then what we did was say, okay, ten, f 10 or 15 minutes ago what we did was, okay, let's generalize that and appeal not just to the coherence involved um, in self-governance synchronically, but the coherence involved in self-governance over time, where that coherence, remember, is this kind of two-parameter coherence, at coherence at a time, coherence over time, and the coordination of the two. And that's what gave us, at least initially, the norm DPR. So this is just reminding you of the, the line of thought that you, I, and the reflective penny agent are going through. So now I want to go first. I want to take it one step further. Say, well, if that's a, 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 if that's a reasonable way of trying to find a Harmon-esque rationale for my planning norms, I can push it further and say, well, maybe there are other constitutive conditions of self-governance other than these coherence conditions. If so, and if the argument was these rationality norms are tracking constitutive conditions of self-governance, because we were focusing on the coherence conditions, because those were the ones most salient since we started with the synchronic case, and they're also the ones that the myth theorist is directly challenging, so we started with those. But we can generalize and say, well, if there are other constitutive, necessary constitutive elements of diachronic self-governance, then we could 
ask what they are and whether or not there's a rationality demand to conform to that. And that gives us some room to consider an argument in favor of a kind of mandate in favor of the end of diachronic self-governance. Remember, we're, the end of diachronic self-governance, the idea is going to be, isn't constitutive agency, but if you go back to the model of, of a planning agent's diachronic self-governance, it's playing a very central role in diachronic self-governance. So if the, we're going to justify these rationality norms as tracking constitutive necessary constitutive elements of self-governance, maybe we can justify, maybe we could say that, well, there's some kind of rational demand to have that end. Because after all, that end is, let's, let's suppose, I mean, this is, we're going to have to worry about this, That's, that end is a, a kind of necessary element of self-governance, and the whole strategy is to think of ra the rationality as tracking and requiring, you know, defeasibly, pro tanto, uh, these constitutive elements of self-governance. So quite now we've opened up a way of finding a special status for the end of diachronic self-governance without making it a constitutive, constitutive of agency. Okay. But, but so the, the, the way we're, what we could put in terms of an argument, there's this idea that there's kind of rational pressure in favor of satisfying, if you can, the conditions of self-governance. That, that was the generalization. Right, not just the coherence conditions of self-governance, but the conditions of self-governance. What's if there are further ones other than coherence conditions? And then there's this argument, th this idea, which uh, is going to take us back to discussion, uh, uh, in particular because of a question from Gunders last time, uh, but that we had last time. Um, uh, the idea when I was con um, articulating the building blocks for the construction of diachronic self, of planning agents, diachronic self-governance, one of the building blocks, because it seems so important in a central case of diachronic self-governance, namely willpower, one of the building blocks was the end of diachronic self-governance. But if that's, if, so, if that's enough, so to speak, to be closely enough connected to diachronic self-governance that this rational pressure grabs a hold of it, then we, we got it. Now, part of the story is going to be, uh, w one worry you might have about that is, well, you're just thinking of a very special case, willpower. But of course, that's just, a, you know, you don't go to that many parties, okay? Um, but, and this goes back to something that came out in the discussion last time, but I, I want to get it explicitly on the table a part of this possible argument is going to be to emphasize that these willpower cases are actually pervasive. This is what I was starting to talk about last time. Of course, you know, resisting the extra drink at a party is not a pervasive problem, although it's a common one. Uh, but in fact, when you think about planning agency over time, there's, you know, almost constantly potential destabilizers. Some of them we call the temptation to procrastinate. So procrastination is kind of a great example to think of, right? There are all these potential destabilizers. And um, so uh, a, a if the end of diachronic self-governance were a kind of essential part of how we solve the potential threat of destabilization in temptation cases, it would be kind of at the heart. It would be really a central feature of diachronic self-governance because these temptation cases generalize. Okay, so that's premise three. And the conclusion of this possible argument would be uh, that the rational pressure in one, that is the pressure we get from generalizing the model of rationality is tracking conditions of self-governance to conditions of self-governance that are not merely coherence conditions. The rational pressures there favors the end of diachronic self-governance as a general feature of the agent's framework. It doesn't just favor it as something that you need when you're going to a party. <laughs> right? It needs favors it as a general feature of the framework because, because of the systematically present pressure of, de of, of destabilization of planning agency. That's the argument. That's the pl um, if we could get that argument, let's be clear where we are, we would get a kind of rational mandate. This, 
this is what I said in conversation the other day. It kind of surprised me that I ended up here. I didn't expect this, uh, that there's a rational mandate for the end of diachronic self-governance, but I convinced myself that there is, at least next hour or so, I believe it. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, it, this argument has the conclusion that there's a kind of rational mandate to have this end of diachronic self-governance. If that's true, lots of stuff's going to happen. Okay, so this is kind of a, an important moment. Um, let's reflect a little bit on this possible argument. Um, it, the support for the third premise, which is about the centrality of the cases, I've kind of alluded to already. It's the pervasiveness of cases of these potential destabilizations procrastination being a kind of great example to think about. So I am inclined to think this is, this is, a, this is a pretty clear stuff that uh, um, the person who really helped me see this was Sarah Paul, actually. And, um, uh, it, uh, and the person who's written widely on procrastination is uh, Sergio Tenenbaum. So uh, I, I'm inclined to think the third premise is, is uh, about the centrality of such cases is quite plausible. It's the second premise that you're going to worry about and that, and in effect, w we were worrying about last time. That is, you might, and that's the second premise, the second premise, we could interpret it as just the idea that the end of diachronic self-governance kind of helps. But probably the argument needs more than that. It needs that it's necessary or needed. And that's where you might worry, and that's where Gunnar worried last time. Um, now, you might worry because you have an alternative account of what features of the agent's standpoint solve the destabilization problem. And that's what David Velleman has. And it's really useful to see that. So. Um, this is, this is the Velleman picture, that our interest in understanding ourselves is what explains why it makes sense to give significance to continuity with one's past intentions. Here's the quote. My intellectual drives favor fulfilling my past intentions. Because you make yourself more intelligible to yourself by following through. Okay. I call that Velleman's intellectualism, and it's, and it's closely tied to what I've called cognitivism about these planned rationality norms. That is the idea that they're really riding piggyback on theoretical norms on beliefs. because. This is all, uh, this is, the picture is all this that in, in s um, giving, I'm giving significance to continuity of my past intentions because I get a better set of beliefs about myself. I'm more intelligible to myself. I think there are systematic reasons to be wary of that kind of intellectualist picture of practical rationality. So uh, it's for that kind of background reason that I would argue that uh, if that's the alternative you have in mind to the end of diachronic self-governance as the way of solving the destabilization problem, then my alternative is superior. <laughs> superior because it gives a more natural account of practical rationality that's tied to a practical something of practical significance, self-governance, rather than the idea that practical rationality is riding piggyback on theoretical rationality. Of course, that's a very general discussion, but for present purposes, I'm going to, uh, and I've said things briefly about why I believe that, but at least give me this conditional that if, if you don't want to move in this kind of intellectualist way, then the Velleman effort to give an alternative to my two, so, so two says what you need is the end of diachronic self-governance. He says what you need is the end of self-intelligibility or self-understanding, right? Okay. Uh, I favor my own view on that. Okay. But, and this is what came out last time, you might think we're still not home yet because if you actually look at the, um, the literature, it, it the Velleman, uh, um theory is very salient, and so we, we're, we've addressed that. But we, this, for all I've said, there are alter other alternatives here. Now, the alternatives, we want them to be non-intellectualistic. We, we want them not to appeal to an, an end of kind of a form of understanding or self-knowledge, because that's going to lead to cognitivism about these norms, which leads to this problem about cognitivism about these norms. Okay. But maybe there's another alternative. It's got to be general. 
This gets, it can't, we can't, it can't just be kind of here and there, sometimes it works. It's got to be sufficiently general because the problem is general. It's the problem of stabilizing the planning structures, given the pervasiveness of the problems of temptation, understood broadly to include, for example, temptations to procrastinate. Okay. So we need something general. We also need, and I don't say this here, I should have, we also need to be careful that we don't, without noticing it, retreat to a kind of two-tier pragmatic theory. Right? We don't, because at least what I've argued is, though there's a lot of insight in two-tier pragmatic theory, it's not going to solve our problem, and that's what SMART taught us. Okay? That is, we don't want to be able, to, we don't want to say, well, look, by and large, over time, you'll do a lot better if you resist temptation. <laughs> I mean, that's probably true. It's the sort of thing we learn from our parents, right? But that doesn't explain what, what in the particular case speaks for willpower. That's Smart's point about rule worship. Okay. So that said, I haven't argued there isn't any other alternative, but I've tried to impress upon you how, you know, how, what, this, what it would have to do. That said, what I'm going to do is come back to that after I say more about my alternative. Okay, that'll help me articulate further kind of the theoretical problem. Okay, so I think we could put it this way that we've so far reached a kind of tentative conclusion. It's very, it's tentative. There are, lot, there are a number of things we have to fill in, but the idea is there's a kind of, if your planning agent is capable of diaconic self-governance, then there's a kind of irrationality if you don't have this end. That's what the argument points towards. And so I'll call it the norm of rational and diachronic self-governance and use that acronym over there, okay. That we haven't established this, but we've seen how the strategy of self-governance moves in its direction. It's weak, even though it's striking to me. It's weak because it doesn't tell you uh, that the end of diachronic self-governance has to pre be preeminent. It doesn't tell you kind of what its relative standing has to be in an agent's standpoint. It doesn't help you with this problem that I don't, I actually may not have even talked about before, but it was on the, was on, was on the on a slide and I don't think I got to. The, the, the problem that was actually very deep and I, I'm not sure I am fully, I fully know how to handle this. So this is a kind of footnote, but step back. So uh, I'm thinking of a planning agent's diachronic self-governance is, so to speak, relativized to a planned temporally extended activity. Uh, it's, it's something, it's a, it's a property of the agent's activity within a planned temporally extended activity. Okay, but at any time we're engaged in multiple planned temporally extended activities. Some of them are actually temporally embedded in others. Some of them are temporally overlapping. Some of them are temporally distinct and the end of diachronic self-governance <laughs> looks like, with some qualifications, it's going to kind of look at all that. <laughs> so we don't. So it kind of makes it a little unclear, clear what, how to think about this. In saying that the end of diachronic self-governance helps support willpower, of course, I was just thinking of a particular temporally extended activity, one which, to go back to the toxin temptation discussion, has a kind of temporal footprint that it goes beyond the actual temptation to later reflection and so on. But still, I was focusing on a single temporally extended activity, and you, you might worry what to do when you recognize the, that, you know, we're involved in multiple ones. But I haven't solved that problem. So that's just f context for further philosophical reflection, and that's the sense in which this norm is kind of weak. It doesn't really solve those problems, but it's substantive because it says that if you don't have this end, there's, there's a kind of irrationality there. You might, it doesn't s say to what, what degree of preeminence you have to give the end. Okay. 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 So that's, uh, the claim that there is certain kind of rational pressure to have the end of diachronic self-governance. Now we have to come back to, well, maybe not yet, what we've been putting aside for so long. 
So we've got this kind of web of norms, the, the most prominent being PCC, which is the norm of plan consistency and coherence. It's a synchronic norm. DPR, diachronic plan rationality. And what was it, R-E-D-S-G? The, the, uh, a norm that says, have the end of diachronic self-governance. Okay. We've got this web of norms, and we've got a kind of argumentative structure that explains how that web of norms would make sense systematically it has responsiveness to conditions of self-governance, both synchronic and diachronic. And that promises to satisfy, insofar as these are coherence norms, the coherence desideratum, that is, explain why this isn't just mental tidiness. That was the myth theorist's challenge. It promises to satisfy the commonality of desideratum because we're getting a kind of unified picture of synchronic and diachronic norms. But we haven't yet answered the question why would you think that systematically there's a reason to conform to these norms? Okay. That's what I call the reason desiderata. Now, I think at this point, we need to come to terms with a kind of, with two ways of thinking about the reason desiderata. Excuse me one sec. Remember where we are. We're supposing some norm R. And we've got at least three of them up there, you know, PCC, DPR, REDSG. You know. But we take some norm R such that we've got this kind of initial prima facie case in support of seeing it as a norm of practical rationality. It's a case that says, well, you can see it as a norm of practical rationality because it's suitably um, tracking conditions of self-governance. That's the prima facie case. So suppose we, we know that about R. We want to know whether or not it really, we, that is, the reflective planning agents who's reflecting, or us reflecting on our behalf, want to know, okay, is it, is it, I got that, so kind of I can see why it's kind of a candidate for norm and practical rationality, but is it? Well, it needs to satisfy the reasons is it erratum as well. That's what I'm assuming. Okay. But there's actually two different things we could ask here. One, which is you might say, okay, what, what, what I need, as the reflective plan answer to show, is there's a reason for me to conform to this norm whether or not I actually do conform to it. So right. But we can also have a, kind of ask a slightly different question. If I do conform to it, then is there a reason that favors my conformity? Now, all that I've said about a reason desiderum so far has not actually distinguished between these two ideas. One is, there's a reason whether or not I conform to it. The other is, if I conform to it, then there's a reason that supports that conformity. And my conjecture is, insofar as the reasons that are autumn is a legitimate demand on being a norm of practical rationality, a demand that the reflective planning agent wants to satisfy, it's enough to satisfy B. B being that if you, if you do conform to norm, there's a reason it favors your conformity. After all, as I say, in showing that the norm satisfies B, we show that in any relevant case of conforming to the norm, your conformity is favored by a reason for that conformity. That added to the initial prima facie case in favor of the norm, which was the self-governance-based case. It kind of tracks these conditions of self-governance. We have this generalized argument about why that matters. Why, you know, why that's an important feature of, of a norm. I'm making a conjecture. I don't, know, I don't know how to argue for it beyond its plausibility and its theoretical implications. So maybe we should talk more about it. But the conjecture I'm going to make at this point is if I can show that a norm for which we have this kind of initial self-governance-based prima facie case does satisfy B, that if you conform to it, you have a reason to, That'll be enough to put it over the top. <laughs> okay, it's a reason of practical rationality. Okay. And here's the deal. That this norm that says there, there's a rational demand to have the end of diachronic self-governance is going to satisfy B. Why? Well, was, let's go back to the norm. It says, uh, if you, to satisfy that norm, you have to have the end of diachronic self-governance. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, 
if you have the NF diachronic self-governance. And background assumption I've been making throughout, self-governance is a human good. So we can get from the end to a reason. That's the way we've been proceed proceeding. So we get a reason for this diachronic self-governance. Um, and then we get this inference that we've been using, reason for diachronic self-governance. Diachronic self-governance is available. So reason of diachronic self-governance for necessary constitutive element of diachronic self-governance. That was, that was the form of argument we used to say there's a reason of synchronic self-governance to be consistent in your plans. Okay. So we get a reason of diachronic self-governance for conforming to that norm. Given that the self-governance is available to you, Remember, the inference from reason for x to reason of x in favor of a necessary constitutive element of x, I'm assuming, requires the further premise that x is available to you. Okay. So we have to have this correct self-governance is available to you. I'm also assuming, so in a, I don't think there's a circularity here, but I am, I just kind of get, just get everything out on the table, I'm assuming in saying this, that the end of diachronic self-governance is necessary for diachronic self-governance. And I'm showing you implications of that. Okay. So in the background, you might worry, well, maybe it's not necessary because there's an alternative way of solving the stability problem. Okay. But right now, I put that on hold. Okay. So then the thought is, uh, for this, using this argument, this norm that says this, this rational demand to have the end of diachronic self-governance satisfies the reasons that are wrought on, so long as we understood it in the lines of B, that is, the lines that say, if you, sa if you satisfy the norm, then you, had a, then you have a reason for conformity. Because if you satisfy the norm, you have the end of diachronic self-governance, which then gets you a reason to conform to the norm. <laughs> May look suspicious, but there it is. So we conclude that that norm is a norm of practical rationality, since we had the the prima facie case for it, the prima facie self-governance case for it, we said there's just one more thing to get it over the top, got to satisfy the reasons that are rotom. Reasons that are rotom, you can interpret two different ways, but I've argued the, the B way is enough, and we got it. Now, the cool thing is, once we get it, we also get satisfaction of the reason desideratum in the A way. Why? Well, I think there's a very natural idea here, which is actually an idea, some, pretty much in the spirit of the idea of Chris Korsgaard's in her, in her initial response to Bernard Williams, and which actually Williams granted, which is if there really is a rationally mandated end, then it's in the agent's standpoint. My memory of that discussion, this is that journal of philosophy paper of hers, is then Williams has said, yeah, that's right, but I don't see why you'd expect any of the things you're talking about to be rationally mandated ends, right? And you know, like conforming to the categorical imperative or something. But, but the idea that if it really is a rationally mandated end and it's part of your standpoint, that seems right to me. If you're thinking about a standpoint. But then, once we know that this norm that requires, rationally requires the end of diachronic self-governance is a norm of practical rationality that requires the end of diachronic self-governance, we can infer it, it, it's a norm of practical rationality because it satisfies, in part because it satisfies the reasons that are autumn in the B way. We can infer that the agent's end, uh, sorry, the agent's standpoint does include the end of diachronic self governance in the sense that it's rationally required. But then he has a reason to conform to this whether or not he conforms, <laughs> because, <laughs> he, because the end of diachronic self-governance is in his standpoint. Maybe he doesn't actually have the end, but it gets to be in his standpoint in the sense that his standpoint automatically pick, picks up anything that's rationally demanded. So um, in this kind of, you should pardon the expression, bootstrapping sort of way, uh, it looks like this norm satisfies indirectly is going to satisfy the reason that are rotom under sort of along lines of A, as well as along lines of B. Recall that A and B was. So there is going to be a reason for the agent to conform to whether or not she does conform, because the norm that requires the end satisfies B, so it's a norm of rationality. So the end is implicit in the standpoint. And then there's a reason whether or not he conforms. 
to um, that is whether or not it has the end a reason to conform to the norm. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Let's let's see where we are now. So the conclusion is that this no, su this surprise you know this the surprising conclusion is that this norm that says it's, there's a rational demand to have the end of diachronic self-governance is a norm of plan rationality that satisfies the reasons that are on it. We know it satisfies the other desiderata in the sense that it's kind of come right out of the general form of argumentation of the self-governance strategy. So now we can now we're on a roll. <laughs> Let's go back to some of the other norms. DPR. Remember, there's DPR. It's a norm that says, you know, uh, if you could, if it's with if it's available to you to keep going consistently with your standpoint, where your standpoint now is going to include the end of diachronic self-governance, so there's going to be the possibility, at least sometimes, of this being a case of willpower, um, then that's what you're required to do. That's what this norm says. And it, it seems fairly natural, without going through the, the tedious details, to say, well, this norm that says rational demand to have the end of diachronic self-governance, well, it says there's a rationally mandated end of diachronic self-governance, Supports that supports an associated reason in favor of diachronic self-governance. That's okay. And then that reason is going to induce a reason of diachronic self-governance, not to be irrational in the way articulated in DPR. Because if you're irrational in the way articulated in DPR, you're violating conditions of diachronic self-governance, and you have a reason of that would violate the, the reason of diachronic self-governance. So we get that now that DPR satisfies the reason to sit abroad on. So we're halfway home. That is, we have these norms, that DP, d these two anyway, that have satisfied the initial prima facie case in terms of this kind of general structure of reasoning of the self-governance strategy. And now we've given an argument that they do satisfy the reasons to sit abroad on. And so they're norms of practical rationality. And we can imagine a reflective planning agent going through all this. Having got there, we can go back to what was a kind of a lingering issue that I mentioned in the first lecture, which is, well, I could put it autobiographically, and I did then. I said, you know, when I first thought about the plant stability stuff, what I had available was the idea of the snowball effect and rational non-reconsideration. And I still, that's still available. I'm taking that just clear stuff. You buy a, a uh, non-refundable ticket, you have more reason to stick to your plan <laughs> than you, you did before you bought the non-fundal ticket. <laughs> okay, that's the snowball effect. And it, it's risky and costly to reconsider many times. Okay, so that's just a done deal. Okay. My question at the beginning, at the, uh, in, that, uh, in, that, uh, in that first lecture, and the question's been in the background is, in thinking about diachronic plan rationality, do we need something more? Well, now we have an argument that we do need something. Need may not be the right word. We now have an argument for something more. Because if we put together DPR with the demand for the end of diachronic self-governance, we get this extra pressure over and above the snowball effect and non-reconsideration stuff. The extra, and you can see that by thinking about the two examples. Systematically, DPR is going to support resisting brute shuffling. That's what we said earlier. And sometimes, DPR, given the required end of diachronic self-governance will support willpower in the face of temptation, in both cases, in ways that don't depend on snowball effects or the cost of reconsideration. So we've got a, a heftier norm, a heftier kind of conservatism, but it's still a kind of modest conservatism because, um, as, I, as I said before, I mean, in, in the willpower case, uh, it's, it may well be that diachronic self-governance isn't that important to you, and so you should still give up your plan. It, so it's not a kind of rigid conservatism, but it gives us a kind of conservatism. A great question is, you know, there's a discussion of conservatism in epistemology about belief, and one question is kind of how these things might relate to each other. My, uh, uh, this actually gets to a question that John Broom asked at one point about the relation, once you start thinking of it this way, between this and theoretical rationality. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that you get an argument for belief conservatism out of this. Okay, but you do get an argument for plan conservatism. Okay, maybe you do get an argument for belief conservatism, but I haven't asserted that. Okay, 
the next thing we can say is we can remind ourselves that diac what is diachronic self-governance? Uh, where, uh, where I'm thinking now of a planning agent's diachronic self-governance. I should have said that there. Okay. Um, well, we have a model, right? It's, it involves synchronic self-governance at times along the way. So if you have the end of diachronic self-governance, then there's some niceties here I'm not going to worry too much about. I think it's perfectly natural to suppose that if you have the end of diachronic self-governance and diachronic self-governance involves synchronic self-governance, then your end extends to the synchronic self-governance. Okay. If so, now you, if, if you have this pressure, rational pressure to have the end of diachronic self-governance, you have a rational pressure to have the end of synchronic self-governance. I'm assuming, again, the background, these are good things for human beings. So we get a reason for synchronic self-governance, and then if it's available to you, we get a reason of synchronic self-governance to conform to these norms that are tracking necessary constitutive elements of self-governance. So PCC tracks a kind of coherence and consistency that is a necessary constitutive element of a planning agent's synchronic self-governance. So what we've shown is the synchronic plan norms, especially PCC, let's just focus on that, the norm of plan consistent coherence. Not only do we have this kind of initial prima facie self-governance-based case for it, but we've shown why you would expect there to be systematically a reason to conform reason of self-governance to conform, understanding reason in the way that I've been in these lectures. So there's our interim conclusion. There are norms of plan rationality. They satisfy the reasons as iteratum. Uh, because of the way we proceeded, we've kind of made, uh, it's kind of transparent, I think, that we're working within the spirit of the commonality desideratum. The commonality desideratum was the idea that to try to find a common account and all this is available to a reflective planning agent. Cool. Time for that interlude. OK. Uh, where we were, remember, was I can see how the end of diachronic self-governance could be a solution to the, de this, the destabilization problems that willpower points us to, temptation points us to, procrastination points us to. I can see how it would be a solution, but why is it the only solution? That's where we were. And I said, well, it's got to be general. It can't be kind of implicitly getting back to a kind of two-tier pragmatic theory. It can't be intellectualistic. I'll give you all reasons for that. Okay. Um, uh, because of that last condition, I didn't think the development alternative was one we should accept. But that's not to say there's not another alternative. And philosophers, being what they are, it's almost impossible to say there's not another alternative because they're so clever, they'll come up with something, right? So uh, I don't know how quite to argue that, uh, except to emphasize something that has been implicit, which is it's not just the what's, if just think about what's emerging. It's kind of, think of it this way, we've got to solve four simultaneous equations. We need a solution to these four simultaneous constraints. We want an end that stabilizes planning agency over time in a way that supports the possibility of diachronic and synchronic self-governed willpower. Right? This, is, this is what the end of diachronic self-governance is doing in the theory. It's giving us that end. It's supporting a reason in favor of conformity to the norm that it requires itself. It's supporting a reason in favor of the other norms. And it's doing all this in a way that doesn't involve a, crit a criticizable intellectualism. Because, you, in fact, the development story, you might could actually kind of, in a way, it does this stuff too, but it, it's got the intellectualism. Although I'm a little unsure I should say that about two for the development story, but okay, let's not worry about that. So think about the appeal to the end of diachronic self-governance as an effort to satisf of constraint satisfaction. You've got these we were looking for an end that simultaneously solves these different problems. It does it. Might there be another solution? I don't know how to argue there isn't, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe there isn't. Um, that's a great question. But having noticed it and flagged it, I'm going to proceed on the assumption that we've picked out a unique solution, even though I haven't really said something that establishes that. 
Okay. I have tried to convince you that it's it's going to be hard. You're going to have to not you're going to have to get something that's going to do all this. But that's as far as I've been able to get. Okay. So um, there's also this question, which I won't, which is, um, which I won't, uh, won't try to address, but but I'll say something about, which is how and this was coming up in our exchange last time, right? Um, what's at stake here? There's a way of thinking in which it, it's not, there's not that much at stake because after all, if you have a way of supporting these rationality norms, a way that allows the reflective planning agent to to think of herself as okay, that's cool. These are reflectively stable. And then someone comes along and says, well, here's another way. <laughs> so, okay, add it in, put it down, write that down. Okay, okay. So in a way, it shouldn't be a threat. On the other hand, there's parts of the argument, and I, I try, in one place in particular, I try to flag it, where it looks like I need the idea of necessity, that this, is need, that this particular end is necessary. So it's kind of unclear what the stakes are. In the end, okay, so that's, I, I guess I won't say anymore. You can read that. That's okay. Okay, so now we're ready to start wrapping up. We've got these two different ideas that have been in, in the lectures. Well, we've got lots of ideas, I hope, in the lectures, but two in particular. One was the multiplicity of agency. Remember, that's what I said in the first lecture. I said, look, don't try to think that these norms are somehow inescapable because, after all, planning agency is not inescapable in the sense of, you can't be an agent without being a planning agent. Their agency comes in various types. I learned that, well, from, in many ways, it's implicit in a lot of philosophy. It's explicit in Paul Grice's method of creature construction. It's implicit, for example, in Harry Frank's th Frankfurt's theories, because the whole point was there are different kinds of agents. There are wantons. There are other kinds of agents, right? So agency is multi mul multiple. Okay. Planning agents are a special kind of agent. What I said right at the beginning was, I'm not trying to convince a non-planning agent to be a planning agent, though there's a lot to be said. Um, but the, the fundamental concern is, given that you are a planning agent, can I say something to you to help you be, for you, it would be ref uh, the, the norms will be stable upon reflection? Okay. And I think we can now. I think we've earned the right to suppose that in the thinking of a reflective planning agent, these norms will be reflectively stable. If you put together the things I've been saying. Uh, if you're a planning agent like us whose rational analysis involves these norms, where I'm assuming, remember, these norms have a kind of independent significance. That's because, that is, if you, if you say, that's the oh darn it reaction. I have a dental appointment at noon. I have a lunch appointment at noon. I don't say, well, you know, other things equal. These things happen. I'll try, you know, I say, oh darn it. I may say something worse than that, but for, this is on film, right? So, um, um, so there's a rational dynamics that involves these planning norms with independent significance. Uh, and remember, this was something I worried about the first lecture. Uh, I am narrowing the field a bit because I'm thinking of planning agents with the capacity for self-governance. Three-year-olds, maybe Tomasello's great apes, they're kind of over here, right? I'm assuming the great apes don't have the capacity for self-governance although I'll, we await the next Tomasello experiments. <laughs> but uh, so I'm narrowing the field, but that seems fair. I argue in the first lecture, that's fair. If, if, if these norms would be reflectively stable for a planning agent who has the capacity for self-governance, that would be good enough to do what we want, which is protect the planning theory from the instability of the argument from the myth theorists that the norms won't survive reflection. So if you have the capacity for self-governance, you're going to see that this if you've listened to my lectures anyway, that this, <laughs> um, uh, uh, that your, this rational dynamics of your practical thinking has this kind of coordinated rationale. There is the two-tier pragmatic argument, and then there is the point about the way in which self-governance grounds these norms, provides a rationale for those norms. That's what I've been arguing. And so, on reflection, you, you, you have reason to be settled. I claim. Now, be, we have to be careful what we've shown and what we haven't shown. So suppose you are a, a purposive agent who doesn't engage in planning in the strong sense. Maybe kind of does some kind of plan-like calculations, but it's all kind of, these are just kind of rules of thumb. Um, 
handy calculation devices. So you don't have, you don't, your thought is not guided by norms that give independent significance to consistency and coherence. And I've argued on reflection should give independent significance to a kind of diachronic continuity, right? Uh, given that that's the kind of guy you are, if you're trying to find the underlying rationale for your norms, you won't end up where we had just ended up. And nothing I've said s entails that you've made a mistake. I mean, the two-tier arguments might be sufficient to say, you, if you could be a planning agent, you're missing out on a lot. Okay, So that's always in the background. But the self-governance stuff is only engaged once you're a planning agent, in my sense. Okay. It's not there to persuade you to become a planning agent. That said, if you're a, a, an agent who's a purposive agent who doesn't plan in the strong sense, and you do have the capacity for an end of diachronic self-governance, or self-governance generally, there will be a reason for you to conform to these norms, and you will have available to you the kind of argument of self-governance for treating these norms in the way that we do as kind of having a kind of independent significance. So there is a kind of instability for you because there's, once you have the end of diachronic self-governance and the ability, uh, the capacity for it, there's going to be pressure from the self-governance argument to treat these norms that you've been using as mere rules of thumb as having independent significance because there's reasons of self-governance are supporting, would support that. In contrast, if you're already a full-blown planning agent with the capacity for self-governance, self it's going to be reflectively stable. The and that's what we need to defend the planning theory against the threat that I worried about, or so I think. Almost done. That's, our main, that's my main conclusion. Remember, I started out, uh, I'm coming at this in the, in the following way. I think the, the planning theory gets at a kind of dynamics that includes a rational dynamics, a nor a kind of gu normative guidance that's extremely powerful and is a core, what I called at the beginning, the first lecture, a core capacity. It underpins so much of our practical capacities, our cross ability for cross-temporal organization, our ability for sociality of certain kinds, as I've emphasized, a kind of self-governance. I wanted to be sure that this explanatory model wasn't threatened by worries about n the norms not being reflectively stable. And I think I've now said enough to explain why it seems to me it's not. It, the explanatory model is not. Okay. And we've done it in a way that doesn't retreat to cognitivism or to a subs appeal to a substantive constituent aim. Okay. Um, I can't resist the coda, though I've now gone an hour. But give me two more minutes, okay? Because um, it, it might be kind of fun. So here's what we're thinking about a planning agent's thinking. That it, 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 this is, in a way, to go back to the first lecture. It's got... It, it, the planning agent's practical thinking is embedded in this, these temporally extended plan-infused frameworks. They, uh, they pose problems. How am I going to get to Lund? They, they filter options. I can't go to Lund on Monday because I'm teaching that day. Uh, they involve, I've argued, a kind of default continuity over time. Uh, it, all this has a kind of underlying rationale that is involved in a coordinated appeal to two-tier arguments and self-governance-based arguments. Now, in this practical thinking, so I got a, uh, I'm in the midst of the temporally extended planned activity of getting myself to Lund. <laughs> okay. uh, there's a, and I kind of have to say, well, United, SAS, uh, train, bus, uh, Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm weighing reasons all over the place. Right? United's more expensive, but more comfortable. Than, you know, stuff like that. Okay. So, there's all this plan-framed weighing of reasons. It's but the weighing of reasons 
is embedded in these planning structures. The planning structures pose the problems with respect to which the reasons are being weighed. They, can they filter solutions that can for those problems. They have this kind of stability over time that keeps you going in a certain way. So it seems to me that if there's any myth in the neighborhood, it's, remember the myth there is thought the myth was that these were norms of practical rationality. It seems to me if there's, any, if there's a myth in the neighborhood, it's a different one. It's the myth of thinking of weighing of reasons that take, something that takes place completely outside these planned, structured, plan-infused, temporally extended frameworks. That's the mistake. And I'll stop there. Is open. Gunnar Björnsson. Thanks. Um, so I wonder about uh, the need for uh, the end of self governance. Uh, and specifically, uh, I think there is most clearly a need for more than a default. Uh, assumption that you go with your plans in the case of the willpower uh, problems. Um, and uh, there might be other ways of achieving the stability there. So we might have something like uh, what we have in interpersonal relations. We have promising, yeah. which is uh, just a device that uh, uh, make us more prone to stick to what we say we will do. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, creates expectations and so on. But we have mm. the capacity of adhering to our promises and yeah. take the mere fact that we've promised uh, yeah. to it ties us to right. the, the, the alternative. Right. And so, so here's uh, so a different way of thinking about this. It says, well, look, for ordinary planning, it's not it's <coughs> not really a big deal to give it up, except, I mean, you're giving up uh, infrastructure that you've put in place for achieving valuable ends. Yeah. So you're giving up some uh, valuable tools when yeah. you give up a plan. Yeah. So that's, I mean, a reason not to do it, yeah. right? A prima facie reason to not to do it. But, um, but it seems to me that the willpower case is different. Uh, uh, and we might think that there we have something that is a resolution, but a resolution is not like a plan. It's something stronger. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, a decision to it's do like the a promise thing. To yourself? Yeah, that it's yeah, it's it's something. So one way of seeing it is like a promise to yourself as a different mechanism. Yeah, uh, and to think okay. this doesn't need to go into the planning thing because we can give up plans. Yeah. You know, it, uh, it okay, uh, and it doesn't seem so dramatic. But give up yeah. resolutions is more dramatic, yeah. and it's more like promising. So yeah. that's a different way of trying yes. to uh, right. undercut the kind of generalization that you Good. need for your argument. So yeah. I wonder if you. I think that's terrific because that it points out a kind of, you know, philosophy is frequently has the structure of decision trees. <laughs> so uh, uh, if we, 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 we could, so, so it points out a couple things. One is uh, there might be, you know, in ordinary language, we, we pick out certain kinds of intentions we form and call them resolutions. Uh, but I'm thinking of that 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 doesn't change the, n the normative structure of things in a fundamental way. That it, okay, but so that's one place, that's one point in the decision tree, okay, or the philosophical th tree. Um, I I'm also skeptical myself about uh, uh, wh how much you can get out of the idea of promises to yourself. I mean, there are obvious puzzles about that idea. I, I know you didn't assert it was literally a promise yourself, but um, uh, um, I guess it sounds to me that the alternative picture would require the idea that just by forming the intention, um, is this right? Does it, re does it require the idea that just by forming the intention not to have the drink I now have a new normative reason not to have the drink, the way in which when I promise I get a new normative reason to conform. Is that the idea? Because that idea makes me nervous. 
Yeah. I don't think it's just the intention. Uh, okay. So I can I intend see. to do things, but I'll be yeah. fine with changing intentions later. I mean, yeah. so, so it's yeah. so if you sometimes you plan to do, you plan to do something even if it will at the time seem not attractive. So I plan uh, to stick to one beer, even if that will yeah, at yeah, the time that's not. Of course the, yeah. And that's a special kind of plan. And yeah. I realize that, that, that it will be hard uh, uh, to, to conform to, yeah. uh, but I think it's valuable uh, to yeah. conform to it. Yeah. And so I prepare my mind in a special way yeah. Uh, to uh, you know, be a bit obsessed about the uh, yeah. about the plan, right? Yeah. And that's a kind of thing we can do. And yeah. and it's in some ways analogous to promising. That was the idea. In and some ways, now it's promising. Uh, yeah. But 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 it's not just a general intention. It's a special intention. Okay. Uh, maybe okay. For okay. a special kind of circumstance. Okay. Uh, I, let me say this. I I um. I think it's a great problem to consider alternative solutions to this. Okay, so uh, one of the things that's driving my discussion is the is the is really the commonality idea, right? So one of the though there are some delicacies here. Uh, I I think it's it's an important fact that. Um, that the the picture we have of temporally of the of the temporal extended glu rational glue applies not just to the willpower. It doesn't pick out the willpower case as somehow something very sp uh, special. It's really it's really uh, an instance of something more general, which is also at work in the resistance to brute shuffling case. Whereas, of course, in your picture, they're very, they're just fundamentally different phenomena. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, further, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the picture I'm trying to develop extends the commonality to the synchronic case. Yeah. So, so one question is, how do you develop this kind of unique rational or reason-giving role of these special kinds of intentions we call resolutions? In, in without getting yourself into kind of problems about, you know, do intention about is getting kind of boot intentions, bootstrapping reasons that yeah. get you into problems. Okay. Yeah. How do you develop that? Okay, so well that's a long discussion. Okay. Uh, the, the virtue of my approach is it has this generality. It shows you that the weak, the the, the willpower case is a, is not a kind of sui generis kind of problem. It's actually, it's it's pointing us towards something very systematic, which and pervasive. That was the point about procrastination, in the sense that th the solution is a solution that gets us to the idea of a kind of cross temporal rational glue that's tied to diachronic self governance, and so. S theoretically also associated with the rational demands that are tied to synchronic self-governance. So the holism, as it were, of the approach seems to me a virtue. It's mm. not a knockdown virtue. Somet sometimes it's better not to be holistic in philosophy. You should, you know, everything is what it is, not another thing. Mm. But anyway, that's kind of how okay. I'm, that, yeah, yeah. And, and autobiographically, that's what had, that's what's been shaping my thinking, is I wanted something that was sufficiently general, so I could give a uniform account of the two. Because remember, for me, the problem was I had this kind of cool idea about snowball effects and non-reconsideration, but then there are these problem cases, and then the thought was, if I want to give an account of the problem cases, that at least is systematic with respect to those, uniform with respect to those. And, that, and okay, and okay, okay, thanks. John Broom. Thank you. I th I think this may be the opposite to what. Gunnar was saying, but I'm not quite sure. It may be actually exactly what he was thinking of. Um, you, you've given some clever arguments, but I'm going to suggest, I'm sorry to say, that the conclusion of these arguments have taken you to a place you'd rather not go. They've given you too much bootstrapping. I think. Well, there is they a kind of bootstrapping going on. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, I said that, and I said that. Yeah, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. well, yeah, you said it at what... But I think this is at a different place. Oh, okay. Let's sorry, see. sorry. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So I just want to try this out with the, with the willpower example. Good. And in order to make the point that I want to make a bit clearer, I'm just going to add something to it, yeah. something that I think is independent of anything you said. Okay. What I'm going to add to it, and this is really just for rhetorical purposes, is the assumption that what you ought to do in this drinking case is drink a lot. Okay. Independent, that is, of any um, resolutions or intentions you've made. Yeah. Apart from that, yeah. the right thing to do at this party is to drink a lot. Good. This is actually music it's to my ears, just but anyway, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> No, it's just that you don't, think s you don't really think clearly when you haven't got alcohol, and so before the party and after the party, yeah. your thinking is just not as sharp as it is after you've had a glass of wine. Then you see much more clearly what the truth is, and the truth yeah. is you ought to drink a lot. Okay. Now, if I'm right... Your, th uh, your theory has, has this implication that if before the party you form the intention of not drinking, and this is in a context where you will also think after the party that that was the right thing to do, not drinking yeah. uh, too much. This, given that you rationally have the end of diachronic self-governance, this intention that you form beforehand actually gives you a reason not to drink or not to take more than one drink. Okay. It's a real reason to do it. Right. And in that case, it could outweigh the independent reason, which That's is right. to drink a lot. That's right. So in fact, it might be the case, it, because of this intention you form right. beforehand, That's right. you ought not to drink at the party. That's right. And furthermore, that means that when, after your glass of wine, you're yeah. thinking very clearly, you should be able to recognize this. Yeah. You should have to think, well, if only I hadn't made that intention, it would be a good idea to drink this, but I have, you yeah. know, and I've got to be yeah. self-governing. Yeah. You could think, actually, you know, the right thing is not to drink anymore, and I won't drink anymore. Now, that's giving too much power. Yeah. I think, to this intention you formed beforehand. That's what I meant by too much. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's I not see the sort of thing that you want. Yeah. Uh, well, um, so it's, we have to remember now that I'm assuming that diachronic self-governance, and for that matter, self-governance, is a good thing. Now, it, going back to yesterday, I, yeah. I know this may be a place where we're not agreeing. Yes, and that's what I thought was the conclusion of what you said yesterday. But I'm just wondering how far this is essential, because as you pointed yeah. out, there are two things. There's whether it's a good thing or whether it's an end of yours. Right. Yeah. You, so yeah. even if it is a good thing, it might not be an end of that's yours. Right. But I think you have rational argument. You, uh, you think, given that it is a good thing... Rationality requires you to take it as an end. Uh, no. Yeah, so that, that, that was that um, to, to take. The, yeah, that's the 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 R E D S G yeah. principles. That 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 that. But of course, the argument for the the that principle didn't wasn't that it's a good thing. Yeah. No. That the, the, the where the, where the goodness of it comes in is in getting from the end to the reason. Okay. Just to be clear, I don't know how this touches your point, but I mean, just to be yeah. clear. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. so that what what that suggests to me is that what I'm saying is further, for me, confirming my view that it's not a good thing. Okay. That and if, I, if that's know, if what's I could going persuade on. That of you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Persuade you of that, you know. Yeah. And I think you should think, you know, I think you shouldn't accept the conclusion of in the willpower case. Yeah. Um, then that might be where we could end up in agreement. It isn't a good thing, because after all, you never argued for that. You just assumed that's it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. So, okay. So then, uh, I, can, I think I understand what's going on. If yeah. you don't think self-governance is a good thing. Now, so self-governance will include diachronic and synchronic self-governance. And as something you actually said once in conversation, of course, the diachronic case is in some sense basic, right? Because after all, our lives are spread out over time and so on. Um, so when we think of self-governance as a good thing, we should be really thinking about diachronic self-governance. Um, and I've just assumed it's a good thing. Right. Okay. And your point is, uh, 
It isn't. <laughs> well, or else there's something else wrong with your argument, right? Yeah, yeah, well, the okay. The conclusion, well, yeah. I think, is a sort of reductio. Ah, yeah. And so either it's not a good thing, which is merely a premise yeah. you assumed, or there's an inval invalidity somewhere in the argument. You know, but you see, I think this might be a, a kind of general... Uh, so this is the flip side of Gunnar, right? Because, um, I mean, you could, you could have the same worry about promising. Uh, after all, yesterday's yesterday, today's today. It's let bygones be bygones. Why would I do what I promised to do? Since, in terms of future-oriented considerations, the better thing to do would be this. Well, the answer is that somehow the fact that you promise has some significance. And of course, a lot of times we worry about how to explain that and so on. So, it, I'm not appealing to promising, yeah. right? But, but, but the idea is that. The structure of your agency engages something of value, and that matters. And it, it's the right and yeah. Okay, now yeah. this is why why I wasn't sure whether I was on the same side as oh, okay. <laughs> or yeah. against. Now yeah. it's beginning to yeah. seem to me I'm on the same side because I think that mere intending shouldn't be able to do this. You know, that's yeah. too much bootstrapping for intending. Uh huh. But it's just not, as strictly speaking, bootstrapping, right? I mean, the intention itself is not what gives you the reason. It's that you're embarked on a on on uh, uh, on a on a on a, a, a plan, temporally extended project, that then there is a reason of self-governance to stick with, right? I mean, so the the kind of bait, the source of the reason, if you will, is the self-governance, not the intention. The intention is just part of the what self-governance comes to now just to be clear whereas so uh, i so i'm hoping it's consistent with everything i said today to, to say that iago's intention to destroy otello doesn't give him a new normative reason to yeah. to lie to otello yeah i'm i'm not too keen on the idea of sources of reasons and things well like that. that's I, a I'm not separate I, actually i'm not sure i don't want to defend uh, that um, language i was just seemed useful in the con yeah. present context yeah but what yeah. I was thinking is, in, in the case of interpersonal dealings, yeah. um, we need promising in order to manage. Yeah. So this is a separate institution that we have. Okay. Maybe, as well as intending, we need something else, which is not intending, but more than intending, or something along okay, those so lines. So that is standing like uh, that, yeah, that, resolution. So that may be yeah. what so okay. I might agree with him about. Okay, that, at that point. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is fascinating and really helpful. Um, what it's showing are, are two things that are going on in this view um, that I, I still believe, but you, you we're highlighting them. One is it really is important that I'm taking it as given as that self-governance is a human good. The, the second is I'm seeking generality of theory. So I'm getting, I would, I want to think of the willpower case within a same, I want to be able to have a theory of the willpower case that's also a theory about resistance to brute shuffling that also is continuous with the theory about synchronic rationality. Those two things are playing a role. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, 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 great. Ingvar Johansson. <coughs> well, uh, first I would like to thank for, for NICE interesting and stimulating lectures and uh, thank you to a brief soon a brief uh, question yesterday i asked you about some more words about the ulysses case today in order to understand the details of your approach better i would like to you to say some words about this case which could be called the Seelig case there is an old movie by Woody Allen called Seelig. It's about a man who, sort of, as I remember it, by compulsion adapts to every homogenous group or right, subgroup right, right. he meets. So yeah. he, he changes yeah. uh, the way yeah. of speaking, yeah. dressing, uh, attitudes, yeah. m m almost all the things he can. Now, assume a teenager looking at the movie, oh, you know, oh, silly, he's cool, he's cool. I make a plan, I'll, and I am, uh, he knows a bit philosophy, Bretton philosophy, he knows, oh, 
I'm in favor of uh, planning an agency. Just now I know what my future will uh, be like. I'll be a Selig. I'll be like Selig. I plan to be like Selig. And so, uh, only, uh, since he knows philosophy, he adds that mm, I'll be like Selig insofar as it is logically possible for the first and second, as far as it is for me psychological or neurologically possible. Now, and the, so he lives his life and so to speak, uh, there is a kind of shuffling of attitudes. Yes. That, and that cannot be brute shuff, uh, shuffling in your sense, nor can it be lack of willpower. Right. And now, now, now comes my simple question. Would you say that this curious case would be a case of uh, diachronic self-governance yeah. or not? Yeah, or? That's great. That's great. That's great. Um, Right, so it's not brute shuffling any more than if you have a plan of sampling the different, you know, you have your little iPod and you, you put it on random and you're, yeah, and you keep going from one song to another, but that's the plan to keep going from one song to another. So that, that's, not, that's not the brute shuffling of the Sartre case, that's just you could have a plan to shuffle. Right, um, right so. He he's got he's treating his life as one big iPod, <laughs> right? <laughs> in which uh, the randomizer is the environment he's in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I mean it's great. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand. No, no, I understand. I, find no, no. Everything, uh, I wasn't being nice critical in any I'm way. I'm sympathetic. Yeah. I just right. want to be so sure. So what yeah. this shows is something that I haven't really tried to address, which is it goes back to the. Um, uh, I guess it's two things. I guess most directly it goes back to the point about hierarchy. So the example I used was you could you could be self-governing with respect to your overall plan of getting a law degree, but there can be lots of change underneath. You go from tort to uh, criminal law, say. Mm -hmm. Now, there could be that underneath there's a lot of brute shuffling. You keep going. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I you know, you in fact, so our yeah, students, yeah. right, yeah. Uh, they, they, they have an overarching plan of getting a Stanford education, and, and what drives you crazy is they keep brutally shuffling across majors. <laughs> One Instead of mom and the free French, it's philosophy and biology. <laughs> okay, so um, there can be, as it were, plan-constrained brute shuffling, and that's, and that's Salik, right, uh, the, the kid who's, um, planning to be like Salik, mm. yeah. Um, no, I'm pleased. Yeah, I'm pleased. I, I just wanted to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah. now, is that? <laughs> give me just give me a second, okay? Yeah. If you're engaged in an overarching planned activity, which the kid is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, under which, as it were, there's a, there's a lot of brute shuffling. Mm -hmm. This has the special circumstance that the brute shuffling is getting triggered by other people mm -hmm. rather than by just a randomizing device, right? And that, mm -hmm. and that is affecting our intuitions because we think of self-governance as being yeah. involving a resistance to other people getting to say, yeah. Which song you're listening to, as it were? Yeah. Um, so uh, it. So one question is whether or not certain kinds of influence of others n blocks the inference from my standpoint is guiding to I'm um, governing. So that's a great question. The second question, which is also a great question, is when you have this kind of hierarchical thing that's the higher level, there's continuity, and the lower level is brute shuffling. So you've got a kind of mix of diachronic continuity and diachronic shuffling. Is there a kind of, is there a, what should we say about is he governing his life? We need to leave some room for you're governing your life despite the kind of low-level shuffling that takes place. But 
these are extreme cases. Okay, so I, I don't. So there are two very general questions: How much can the can the, the continuity higher level suffice for self-governance, given brute shuffling at the lower level? And two, does it matter that other people are the source of the shuffling? Um, which and that's that's a kind of common problem in philosophy about you know the difference between coercion and just things not going well, <laughs> between the, the the storm and the gun put to your head, right, right. So, and I, I those are unsolved problems for me. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> so <coughs> I have another question having to do with, well, it's a similar question actually. So you emphasize uh, willpower and sticking to one's plans. And I'm also interested in really what is it to stick to one's plans. So I don't have as an interesting example as <laughs> Ingvar. Uh, so, I mean, it's also important to be able to reconsider one's plans and mm -hmm. to be flexible. I would say that that's one of the things that is very important and that is humans are very good to do that. Yes. And so uh, suppose then that it's you're back home and your own original plan is to stay at home and work at your university. And then you get an email with an invitation to go to Lund. Yeah. And so you start to plan for going to Lund and you do all this plan framed weighing of reasons and so on. And then you end up uh, sending an email to Dan Sahavi at Copenhagen University asking him to invite you Since I'm to be Copenhagen. Yeah, yeah. No, you're not going to Lund. Oh, so I'm sorry. The plan framed reasoning, uh, weighing of reasons, make you, cause you to send this email to another philosopher in Copenhagen. Okay, so would this be some kind of violation of this end of, of uh, uh, diachronic self-governance, or would it be... I, don't, I, don't, I'm, I guess I'm not sure yeah, I got so it. So you have all these... Did I, did I, did I form... This is the idea that I formed a plan to go to Lund and yes. I gave it up? No, not exactly. No. It's hard no. to say. That's the okay. point. Okay. So you, you get the invitation and you form the plan to go to okay. Lund. Lund. Yes. And then you start to weigh all these reasons within your plan. Yeah. And then you find out, well, that you would like to go away. You find Scandinavia. I don't know which of all the reasons you would weigh would be, but you find, That's I don't know, Scandinavia yeah. interesting, blah, blah, blah. But then for some reason you, you skip, you give up on parts of it. So you decide to go to Copenhagen instead, but you still keep up with the part of going away. Oh, I going. see. Oh, I see. So I, see, I, see. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Ha yeah. Would this be a new plan, or would you sort of? Well, would you think that it would not it really? In some ways, it's like the what we were talking about before. You, yeah. If I'm understanding, you've got a kind of overarching plan. I got to get out of here. <laughs> no, that's a point. You didn't have that from the beginning. So no, that's not from the point. beginning. But mm. I, so I now have. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. So there's kind of two ways of thinking about hierarchy one is the more the kind of more overarching plan is kind of where you start and you fill it in yeah you had the plan just to go to you actually start but then with it's a more sort specific of thing yeah and then implicitly you get the overall the, the more general yeah, yeah you right. it and changes you know so yeah. it's a gradual change yeah and, and and it's kind of hard to say where exactly that change would go wrong so suppose that instead you yeah. send an email to someone at on Iceland yeah. No, in Greenland, say. Yeah. You find a philosopher there. Yeah. But that's not a very well-known philosopher. And you still ask for an invitation. Yeah. I mean, where does it begin to be not so rational? <laughs> uh, <laughs> or is there yeah. a... You know, because there is a chain of, of weighing these reasons, of, the, of, of this weighing, reason, weighing of reasons within a plan that gradually changes into something else. Is there a way to say when... Well, now you have to stop. Um, Would it be still be rational? I mean, if you just keep the going away, you give up on the philosophy part, which a actually in the beginning made it interesting to leave your work because yeah. you wanted to. I mean, is this? So well, there's a couple of things going on. One is this phenomenon that uh, you, you, you start out with a relatively specific plan yeah. But then it's an instance of a kind of more general mm -hmm. uh, 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 activity. Uh, and so you're kind of implicitly committed to the more general activity. And then what you 
find yourself doing is holding on to the more general activity and substituting something else. Yeah, right. and then okay. you sort of gradually, uh, in the okay. end, maybe you Let's go to Mallorca. Let's just stick with that, because that's hard enough. Okay, yes. so, <laughs> so I start off uh, intending to go to Lund, and, uh, and that's going to Lund is a way of leaving my university for a while, so I at least implicitly plan to leave my university for a while. Okay, that's the idea. And then I kind of think, well, actually, if as long as I'm going to leave my university, it might be nicer to go to Copenhagen. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so I give up the plan to go to Lund, but I hold on to the more general plan. Is yes, that, is there are so many different reasons you're also weighing. I mean, so there is a train trip to Lund from yeah. Copenhagen, and there's yeah. the passport controls, yeah. and then yeah. maybe there's better, more Michelin restaurants in Copenhagen. Yeah, no, I understand, uh. I understand, I understand. Okay, so now the question is, uh, uh, so in much of that, uh, so, so maybe the crucial moment is... Uh, when I make the shift from intending to go to Lund to intending to go to Copenhagen. Okay. Um, now, if, um, and suppose I haven't made any promises to the people in Lund. Um, th uh, in making that shift, there's a, at that level of abstraction, there's a break in the plan continuity, right? At a, at a higher level of abstraction, there isn't a break. Mm. Okay, okay. Because there's a break in the plan continuity, and given the kind of simple plan theoretic account of the co connections that are constitutive of diachronic self-governance, with respect to, at that level, there's a break in diachronic self-governance, okay? Mm -hmm. But there might be, this is star starting to sound like what we talk at, at a more overarching level, mm. a, con a diachronic self-governance at the higher level, but not at the lower level. Okay. But even if there's a break in diachronic self-governance at that lower level, uh, there are other things that are important too, and it might make perfectly good sense. Yeah. See, John's going to worry about a, a kind of bootstrapping here, but um, uh, so here I am deliberating. Should I go to Copenhagen, not Lund? I realize that would be to kind of give up on these plans, at least at that level, not at the abstract level of going somewhere. Mm. Um, and so there'd be a kind of breakdown in diachronic self-governance at that level. But it's, you know, it's not that big a deal. And the restaurants really are much better in Copenhagen. Mm. So, uh, so I'm going to give up on the plan. Now, this actually connects up to an important... Um, so there are two things going on here. One is this p kind of levels of generality that get back to the point at which I haven't really, I mean, I'm, I've pointed to that, but I'm not sure I've fully dealt with that complexity. But the, the other thing that's going on is, goes back to s some things I've said along the way. The idea is not, uh, and John Broom got it right. I mean, the, Id the, uh, he remember the idea wasn't that once you get started, considerations of diachronic self-governance are kind of determinative. Mm. That would make us kind of prisoners of our past in a way that doesn't seem right at all. Okay. Uh, the idea is, no, they're not determinative, and they in some cases might not matter that much at all, but there's something going on there that matters. That's what the, ration the diachronic plan rationality norm is tracking, and that's what I want to be able to explain without making us prisoners of our past. Now, you might say, well, if it doesn't matter that much, what's the why we worry so much about? Well, because there are certain cases in which those considerations seem to help us think through what's going on. The brute shuffling cases are the kind of... Uh, because all I need is it's something to matter to explain something which we weren't able to explain, which was what mistake Sartre's young man is making when he brute reshuffles, okay? Th that doesn't yet explain the mistake you're making in giving into the temptation because we don't, the difference between the brute shuffling case and the temptation case, in the brute shuffling case, it's kind of given that the standpoints keep kind of supporting both options because of the non-comparability, whereas in the uh, temptation cases, we need something to shift things back 
Because right now, at the time of drinking, the standpoint actually supports the drinking. So that's why we needed to reflect on the end, the impact of the end, the end of diachronic self-governance. The deep, okay. So, so I'm kind of, I guess I'm just repeating the, th the theory I said, but I'm trying to. So the theory doesn't require that these things are determinative. They may be only of of kind of modest significance, but by having these structures of rationality and reasons that are that it, that in these that I've described, we get a uniform story about the puzzle cases. Um, okay, there's a period at the end of that. Okay, that, that's, that's the best I can do. Okay. Ron Abode. Thank you. Um, the, I find the argument complicated. Now, I thought maybe one way to help me understand it, maybe some other people, is by kind of playing a game where I am this reflective agent who agrees with everything that was said in the last uh, three lectures and with, uh, you know, the previous literature uh, that, that you wrote and all, and still is, is playing hardball and, and, and wants to understand why, why I have a reason, independent of the two-tier, uh, um, the pragmatic stuff, to um, adopt this end of self-governance. So... So here I am. There, the, there is, there is some. Uh, I don't know. We can take a willpower case, or and, and um, so let's let's make it a case. I think the, the, to kind of pinpoint where what you're trying to get, it should be a case where the pragmatic considerations don't suffice. I mean that that will highlight the importance of what what yeah. today's lecture was. Yeah. So let's make it a case where the the two tier the all, all the pragmatic stuff snowball and all this don't are not strong enough to make me uh, follow through with my plan. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what you're offering today is another thing. There is, you have reason to adopt the self-governance as an end, and this will provide you a reason for conforming. So, so let's, if you're willing to tr play this game, so let's, you might have to repeat some stuff, but but maybe in a more simple way, because I'm I'm just asking, um, why do I need to uh, to adapt this end? I, I'm I, why do I to need adapt to adapt the end now? Uh, well, that, uh, um, yeah. you're you you're going to tell me. I already got the part the part. So it's already told me that. Listen, because of uh, if you adopt the end, you have reason to adopt the end, and once you adopt the end, you'll have reason to follow through with the plan. Well, uh, right? Yeah, of course, what I said was there's a rational, there's a rational requirement or demand to adopt the end, and then there's a reason to conform to that rational demand. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but today you, you, you gave the reason, the rationale for adopting the end. Today, today that was part of the, the rationale to... Yeah, uh, yeah. A reason for self-governance. So, Kiru, please... Uh. Say well, I'm again. not sure that's what, what that, no? that may not be quite oh, the okay. way to do it. Now, okay. I, to have a reason for self-governance in this model would require you have the end of self-governance and it'd be a good thing. So what I've given you is an argument about why this, what the rational pressure is to have that end. If once you have the end, you, you have a, there's a reason of self-governance. Okay, so okay. what is... So why, so what why is the pressure for, is having, the the pressure for okay. having the end? So now, uh, and then... Um, then if you have the end and it's good, then you get the, the reason. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So what's the rational pressure to have the end? Yeah. Right. Um, uh, um, let's see. Well. Uh, this is the argument. Okay. The argument is... First of all, the generalization strategy. The generalization strategy is we notice in thinking synchronic norms that you get a rationale for them, one that 
satisfies these promises satisfy the commonality of the desideratum and the uh, coherence desideratum, and ultimately we're going to argue satisfies the reason desideratum. You get a rationale by looking at th those synchronic norms as tracking conditions of self-governance, coherence conditions of self-governance. Then you generalize. Does does the agent who's reflecting have to? This is should be part of his reflection. I'm the, assuming the as much. Yes, yeah, the advantage of the generalization. That's yes, right. The kind um, of the we're doing it, but we're doing it on behalf of a, a planning agent. Okay. Uh, planning agent. Planning agent is saying, okay, this is the way my thinking works. You might just say, well, that's interesting. Maybe I should ask Tversky and Kahneman to tell uh -huh. me about that. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, but uh, she thinks, well. Actually, I would much feel much more comfortable if, if, if it all made normative sense to me, not just it was just kind of the way my mind works that maybe uh, doesn't, really doesn't really survive right. reflective muster. Okay. So she says, um, okay, well, these synchronic norms, uh, Ratman's helped me see, I can see how they could start to make sense because they're tracking these conditions of self-governance. Now, of course, th the... The two-tier stuff is in the background. Of course, there's, there's kind of a reason to be this kind of agent, but that's at the upper tier, uh, pr these pragmatic reasons to be this kind of agent. And I'm assuming that that's not enough to make sense in the particular case about why it would be a mistake to violate the norms. That, um, so I'm assuming that SMART was on to something there. Okay. So she, th she says, okay, in the synchronic norms, uh, what's... what? Over and above the two-tier stuff, what's going on is they're tracking coherence conditions of synchronic self-governance. Cool. Now I'm going to generalize. There are coherence conditions of diachronic self-governance. We need to do a lot of philosophy of action to figure out what they are. But we've now figured out what they are. That was the third lecture. Okay. So, generalize. Uh, there's, uh, uh, this, this would lead, give support for a rationality norm that's in which the norm is tracking the coherence conditions of diachronic self-governance. That was DPR. Okay. Now generalize one more time. There's a th there could be a rationality norm that's tracking conditions of diachronic self-governance whether or not they're coherence conditions. DPR was tracking kind of cross the kind of the coordinated coherence conditions involved in diachronic self-governance. Synchronic coherence, diachronic coherence in the sense of these planned theoretic connections. Okay. Now, we're generalizing one more time. What if there are other ascent kind of necessary, and this is where I need necessity, going back to Gunnar's question a long time ago. What if there are other necessary constitutive elements of diachronic self-governance? That, be be that might be the basis of an argument for a rationality norm as tracking that. Okay, that's the first premise. But, but you can, ex I could agree, this reflective agent could follow, be on board and say, okay, so there's something necessary, but if he's, if he doesn't appreciate, if he doesn't have a reason to meet those coherence, coherency. Yeah, well, we're gonna get there though. Oh, we didn't get Remember? there. Remember? Okay. So, so that's, now that may be, I think it's a feature, you may think it's a bug, of the presentation. So far, I've put uh, the reason desideratum aside because the way I'm going to s argue these norms satisfy it involves first establishing, in particular, the norm we're about to argue for, and then using that to establish the rational pressure for the end that gives you the reason that then it was also a reason for conforming to the other norms. Right, that's how it's going to go. So I don't. So at this point, we don't have a reason to be self-governing. We're going to get it because we're going to get the end, <laughs> and it's a good thing. But but we're not there yet. Right. Okay. Why adopt the end? Yeah. Well, that uh, I'm. Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's. So that's so that's his argument. Okay. So the first argument, <laughs> the first thing is the generalization strategy. We start out with conditions of synchronic self-governance. We go to conditions of diachronic self-governance. Then we generalize even further to conditions of diachronic self-governance, whether or not they're coherence conditions. Then we, the second premise, which is the one that's been called into question, is that a necessary constitutive element of diachronic self-governance 
is the end of diachronic self-governance. Now, and, the, and that's, we've argued about that, right? And, 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 if, and what I said last time was, that's actually a really interesting difference between diachronic and synchronic self-governance. We don't have an argument that synchronic self-governance requires the end of synchronic self-governance. We do have an argument, maybe not one that you fully accept, because that goes back to our discussion, that diachronic self-governance requires the end of diachronic self-governance. If you give me that, that's the second premise, yes. and give me the centrality of these cases, so that you can't just kind of localize it and say, well, you need the end for these very special cases, yes, like when you go to parties, um, then you get the idea that there's a kind of rational, here I put in terms of rational pressure, the what pressure? The one that comes from the generalization strategy in favor of having the end. Maybe this is the part that's difficult. So this may be the part, yeah. And that's, uh, then, then I try to, uh, so th this was, you know, kind of mucking about in the argument itself, and then I got to that. Okay, but it sounds to me like where you're hung up, uh, maybe justly so, <laughs> is how did I get to four? Yeah. Well, uh, is it because you don't believe one of the premises, or you no, think it no, doesn't no. follow? Uh, doesn't f I don't see how it follows. Okay, okay, let's let's oh, so let's think about that. So the first premise is uh, the generalization. I mean, the, the, uh, yeah. we don't want to uh, just like reasons within the self-governing game that that's what we had so far. But then now, we, uh, the w maybe I'm simplifying things. But now there, now we're we're looking for a reason for the self-governing game. So so all these rational pressures are within. The self-governing game, and and so how how oh, did right, we suddenly right. get it? Oh, in a way, I, I I agree with that in a way because remember what I said about it's only for agents who already yes are exactly, but but this but you're still striving to justify it to them so uh, right so no I'm not trying to justify it to them I'm trying to give them resources give them for so. them to see that it all makes normative sense within their own framework. It's not an argument to become this kind of planning agent. I think there are arguments to become this kind of planning agent, but that's the kind of standard two-tier pragmatic argument. This goes back to this question I had yeah. in the first lecture. I mean, it should at least be a reason, it should, be, it should at least be a reason uh, not to stop. Well, well, not to take the, not, not to stop the self-governing game. That's what you... Oh, oh, I see. Okay, uh, yeah, I remember that question. Yeah, yeah, it was a great question. Yeah, okay. A I think when all the dust settles, and I'm now re a reflectively stable planning agent, I know there are these two-tier arguments for being a planning agent, but I, I, I haven't argued, I don't know how to argue, that kind of it, it, it's m it, it, it more maximizes good things to be a planning agent than a schmanning agent, where schmanning is a kind of variation on planning. Because, I mean, we don't know how that works, right? Okay. So there are good reasons to be a planning agent. Okay. That's what I am. It makes normative sense to me because of the connection between the norms and self-governance. Okay. So now I have, uh, why would I change? It, it, it is this it is this like the the the, uh, the heart of the uh, why would I change why why would I stop like so it's uh, I mean it's, it's, it's not an I I'm involved it's in a system that makes that makes sense at the upper level and internally I can make full normative sense of it to the extent that when I think it through. I see that I'm committed to having the end of diachronic self-governance, which gives me a reason, given the value. I guess, I guess... Um, anyway, maybe, I, I would say, I'll that's, that's yeah. all I think I can show. Okay. Okay? I don't know, I tend to think that at the you moment... at the moment, yes. Yeah, at the moment I'm, I'm asking myself whether to continue the game, I need more than g reasons within the game, because... I'm kind of stepping back for a second and asking, is this game worth it? I have other things in my mind. Uh, yeah. And, 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 uh, At that point, yeah. if you're thinking uh, generally, then you're back to the two-tier pragmatic issues. Which I like. I yeah, like yeah, I thought so. <laughs> so I remember, I'm not saying those aren't important. Okay. But I also what got convinced by SMART that they're not enough. Okay. So maybe 
Um, I haven't thought this through, but everyone's, but there is this parallel with Strawson, in fr the Strawson of freedom and resentment, right? We can, because there's a kind of framework here, there is a kind of pragmatic rationale for the framework of reactive emotions. It doesn't play a big role in his argument. Well, the different people read them differently, but it's there. And in fact, he says, if you gave them up, just think what you'd be giving up, right? But within the framework, I w uh, he doesn't actually say that. He tries to say some things to kind of so it will make sense within the framework about why you resent this and are grateful for that. That's the quality of will stuff, right? That is, that's the kind of guiding norm underlying the reactive emotions, responsiveness to quality of will. Okay, this is real quick, but so there may, may be an important parallel, but of course I've, I've my underlying consideration isn't quality of will, but self-governance. Okay, that's future discussion. Thank you. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm really a newcomer, so maybe. Uh, we're all newcomers to philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and newcomers to your lectures. Anyway. But uh, I was wondering, could, could you say in a few words uh, what you object to the intellectualist oh. approach? Oh, I yeah, yeah. Very briefly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good, good. That I went over that very quickly, the first lecture, and uh, it, it obviously is playing a big role here, even though I have... Right. So I think uh, the intellectualism leads you to see these norms. It's hard to see how you're not going to end up seeing these norms as deep down norms of theoretical rationality on your beliefs. And that, of course, is the way Velleman sees it, and others as well, Kieran Setia, for example, though he's not as full-blownly intellectualistic as Velleman. And that's what I have the problem with. I mean, I have a, that is, so the, there's a very specific problem I have, which is coherence of your beliefs doesn't guarantee means and coherence of your plans because you could have coherent beliefs about yourself that involve false beliefs about what you intend, about whether you intend the means. Your beliefs could be completely coherent, but you don't intend the means. So if you go back to the, the hypothetical imperative, it doesn't say if you intend the, if you, he says, Kant says will, but let's not worry about that. If you intend the end, then believe you intend the means. <laughs> it says if you intend the end, then intend the means. But the, 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 the you could get explanatory coherence of your beliefs just by believing you intend the means. Okay, so that, in a way, that's the thin, that's the camel's nose under the tent for me. That shows what's kind of, there's why there's a hard problem that the cognitivist account of the norms faces, and then the argument is the intellectual is, got, is going to be led to the cognitivist account. I mean, I also have general, I think, uh, concerns that it, about the plausibility of thinking that what we're after in acting is self-understanding. You know, that, that requires a certain leap. Uh, on the other hand, Velleman is so brilliant that he kind of, s you know, you start to think, oh, maybe, I don't know. But this, so the specific objection seems to me the one that's kind of going to carry the day. Yeah. So um, two years ago, the board members of the philosophy department here formed a shared intention to... Uh, that uh, Michael Bratman delivered the Pufendorf lectures this year. That is unproblematic. I mean, group members can share an intention, and it's possible for an agent to intend that someone else does something, yes. given your views. Yes. Um, suppose now that something had happened between 2014 and now, our plans just randomly changed. Yes. Um, I mean, that would have been problematic because of costs of reconsideration, etc. But I think that, uh, well, given what you have said, it would also have been problematic because of the pr rationality pressure for plan. So there is a uh, pressure towards planning stability. Yeah. Um, I actually found a passage from Samuel from Samuel von Pufendorf. <laughs> Uh, s sort of supporting what you have been saying. That's uh, terrific. <laughs> it's from uh, On the Duty of Man and Citizen, According to Natural Law. 
page 69. Uh, he says that when plans uh, collapse, it's not only that my efforts are lost on me, but even if I have performed nothing, it's still a nuisance that my plans and purposes are upset. Luckily, nothing of this happened, and we have heard four fantastic lectures, uh, very inspiring. We're very grateful for that, and uh, we have some things to give you oh, um, from the philosophy department. This is a medal. <laughs> Thank you so much. And this is oh a very nice di diploma. Wonderful. A diploma. I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're blowing all those whistles out there. <laughs> thank you. And thank you again. This has thank been wonderful. You thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you.